My name is Les Agassum. I'm a 30-year member of Park Avenue Synagogue and a 30-year of the FJMC. And I feel like uh, if you have anyone uh, on the uh, Zoom watches Saturday Night Live, I feel like I'm a member of the Five Host Club. I've uh, been uh, doing it for so long. But the men's club for me has been a place to make lifelong friends in a small way, give something and get so much more in return. From hearing men's voices, the Yoma Show Candles, to um, Karov's uh, intermarriage, baseball games, and the like, it has been very, very special in my life. Well, I want to welcome everyone to the uh, Men's Club discussion of upheaval, be about the life of Menachem Begin. Uh, thank you all for coming. The movie was a big brainchild of our moderator, Victor Goldsmith. Um, a little bit about Victor. He is a member of Park Avenue Synagogue and Professor Emeritus of uh, uh, Park uh, Pace University, where he served as associate provost for research for 13 years. Currently, Victor serves as a member of the United Jewish Appeal Federation Global Jewish Communities Funding Committee, which includes Russia and Ukraine, numbers four and five countries in Jewish population. He also serves on the board of directors of the Music Conservatory of Westchester School, which is some very, very talented Ukrainian faculty members now currently performing benefit concerts at Carnegie Hall and other venues. At this point, I just want to turn over to Victor. Uh, he has lived in Israel in the Begin era, and he is a long-term uh, member, as I said, of Park Avenue Synagogue. So Victor, without further ado, uh, welcome. Uh, Les, thank you for the very nice introduction, and it's certainly been a pleasure working with you on this uh, project. I thought I would start by briefly mentioning my own vegan interest. I lived in Israel for seven years as a professor at Haifa University, and was there when Sadat visited Jerusalem at Begin's invite. I have special memories of one of the high points of Israel's modern history. Now it is the 30th anniversary yacht site of Begin. My son Jason had just started Kita Aleph, the first grade. If you were in his class on that day, each student made a drawing. My backdrop today is my son Jason's drawing. Now Jason is 50. And this uh, drawing is hanging on my wall. So I'm constantly reminded of, uh, of Begin. Menachem Begin's son is a geologist. And uh, I would meet him on a regular basis at the uh, monthly geology meetings in, uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, he told me that he was uh, working on his PhD at Caltech when his father got elected and uh, father gave him a call and said, come back and help run the country. So uh, I interacted with him just uh, very, uh, very briefly. Okay, so I want to uh, thank our partners. Uh, two years ago, I first saw small parts of the Begin movie at the Open Door Media Studios in the old city of Jerusalem. I have been enamored of this movie ever since and so happy that uh, Les helped in getting it, getting it to come forward to tonight. First, though, I want to thank Rachel Greenberg, the producer head of Or Hatsophone Productions, uh, Hidden Light Institute. She has the license for showing the Begin film in the US and has been a great person to work with on this. Uh, I can mention that Rachel just finished now, uh, I think at least 15 different showings in Israel. And uh, tomorrow she tells me she'll be on her way to Australia when she will be showing this movie at 16 different places. Also, Rachel says that we have, that we have a new contract uh, signed with PBS International. So this film will eventually be, saw, uh, be uh, showed around the world on PBS. I also want to thank uh, FJMC, who made the, who's the vehicle that made this possible. I thank Carl Rubin, and I especially thank Bruce Fagan, who's conducting this Zoom meeting. So Bruce, so far, so good. Okay. <laughs> And I also want to thank the co-presidents of the Park Avenue Men's Club, 
uh, Stephen Darling and Guy Shapiro for their continued interest in upheaval. And I also thank Rabbi Neil Zuckerman of Park Avenue Synagogue. And I want to thank Joel Boosen, president of Temple Emanuel Men's Club for his hard work and dedication on this and many other projects that Les and I worked on together. Most importantly, of course, I want to thank my esteemed and experienced partner in this worthy endeavor, Les Agassiz. If you're here watching tonight, you have Les to thank for, uh, for all his efforts. Without him, you wouldn't be here tonight. Okay, so let me explain the menu and the program for tonight for everybody. So first, we will have three speakers, Phil Rosen, Abby Friedman, and Alan Kahan in that order. I will introduce each speaker separately, then hear their insight and cogent remarks. And then I will ask each of them some questions, time allowing. Finally, we will open it up to the audience for their questions. And uh, I would ask you to submit your questions in chat and to state to whom you direct the questions. And Les will be in charge of that. Okay, so, uh, so now we finished with the hors d'oeuvres. So let's get to the main course. Okay, so first I would like to introduce uh, Phil Rosen. Phil is a very impressive person, highly successful in two worlds, business and the Jewish world. He heads the property group and hospitality and gaming group is one of the leaders of the corporate department of Wild, Gotcho, and Manges, a very uh, impressive law firm. He is also vice chair of the board of directors of the Birthright Israel Foundation, a member of the board of trustees of Yeshiva University, founding and current vice chairman of the board of Yeshiva College, and an active member of numerous other organizations. Mr. Rosen is also one of the key power brokers in the Israel business and political communities. Phil's father was friends and served in Betar with Menachem Begin in Poland before the war. After the war, they rekindled their friendship and Phil had the opportunity to spend time with Begin in the US and Israel. And I hope he will uh, tell us about some of those uh, interactions. Phil, it's yours. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you, everybody, for uh, participating. Those of you who have seen the film, um, I hope you enjoyed it. To me, um, this film was a work of love. I, I became executive producer, I guess, uh, day one, when the idea was brought to me by, um, uh, by Rob Schwartz and Senator Joe Lieberman and uh, they told me about what they wanted to create. And for me, it was uh, a little bit of a dream. Let me explain why. So when I was a child, um, because of my father's um, background, he was a strong revisionist um, in uh, Warsaw, Poland. His entire family was wiped out in the Holocaust, except for two brothers and himself, um, one brother, uh, and he spent the war years in Shanghai. Um, the third brother went to Palestine after stints in Siberia and uh, Cyprus. So he followed the path that uh, you'll remember from the movie Exodus. Um, and he was killed on the last day of the 48 war. Um, but my father, when he was in Poland, his Rosh Vutsa, the head of his group in Beitar, was a fellow named Menachem Begin. And they became friends. And uh, obviously, um, uh, during the war, they separated. Begin's story is well known. Uh, my father's story is less well known. He was part of the Jewish community in, in Shanghai and spent six years um, in, in Shanghai. Um, and so he came to the United States and found out a couple of years later that his brother was killed in the 48 war. 
Um, he went to Israel for his first trip in 49. And um, he looked up his friend Menachem Begin, who was at that point the head of the opposition. Um, and they rekindled the friendship. When I grew up, I was born in 56. When I grew up, while all my friends were reading The Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, I was reading The Revolt, Menachem Begin's biography. And for me, there was no greater hero than a Menachem Begin because he fought for the existence of the state of Israel. And um, he continued his life of fighting against tyranny and against the people who tried to put down the Jews and tried to keep us under, uh, under the stones, as they say. Um, so he was my hero um, from a distance. Um, the story that I'll tell you now um, is the reason why probably this film was so important to me. Um, when I was 13 years old, my father woke me up about three weeks, four weeks after my bar mitzvah. And he said, put, it's a Sunday morning. He said, put on your suit. We're going to the city. I live on Long Island, lived on Long Island then. I put on my suit. We uh, went to Manhattan and we went to a hotel and uh, up to a certain room. He knocked on the door, rang the doorbell. And who appeared at the door? Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin pulled my father in, gave him a hug, and then uh, said hello to me. And they sat down and they spoke for about an hour, an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half. And um, they talked about what life was like um, in the opposition, what life was like in Israel, um, and uh, how much difficulty Begin faced um, in his lifetime as, uh, as the opposition, um, and how hard it would be to create a real state and how much work goes into it. Um, my father gave him, at the end of the discussion, my father wrote a check um, to help him in whatever he needed help in, um, which was totally legal at the time, um, gave him the check. And uh, I called my father over and I said, um, is it possible for me to help too? And my father said, what money do you have? I said, dad, I had a bar mitzvah. I said, I have my bar mitzvah money. I said, I'd like to give some of it to Menachem Begin, to Mr. Begin. Um, Begin came over, gave me a kiss on the forehead and uh, said, I'm not gonna forget this. Um, so that was part A. Part B took place seven years later when Menachem Begin was prime minister and I was um, on vacation in Israel, renting an apartment in Jerusalem. And my father said to me, I called him before Shabbat, and my father said, um, you know where you're going on Shabbat, Shabbat afternoon. I said, where am I going? I said, I figured I'd take a walk. My father said, yeah, you're gonna to walk to the prime minister's house. I said, dad, nobody walks into the prime minister's house without an appointment, without a reservation, without security clearance. My father said, did you ever turn me down in a request? I said, no, dad, I never did. He said, okay, you're not gonna start now. So Shabbos afternoon, I walked over to the prime minister's house. I knocked on the door, security came around. Um, about 10 minutes later, <clears throat> the prime minister comes to the door. He grabs my hand. He said, um, you're my friend. My father's name was Irving, but in Poland, it was Itchik. He goes, you're my friend Itchik's son. I said, I am. And he said, you're the one who gave me part of your bar mitzvah money. I said, I am. He said, and I kiss you, kissed you on the forehead. I said, yes. Pulled me inside, kissed me on the forehead again, pulled me into his dining room. And if you read the book, The Prime Ministers, you would know that Menachem Begin had what's called the, his special 
Shalashudis, Shalosh Sudot, where he had people from all over, all walks of life in Israel at his dining room table. There were artists, there were painters, there were performers, there were rabbis, there were kids, all sorts of people, politicians. Um, and he had me sit there and before they started, he announced to everyone, um, please do me a favor and speak either in English or in a Vrit Kala, so that my friend Itchik's son could understand. So that was part two. And that was probably one of the most enjoyable days of my life. Um, part three was when Menachem Begin, who considered himself the leader, prime minister of the Jewish people way beyond just Israel, when he was invited to come to the Israeli day parade um, right past your, your synagogues. And um, he came to the reviewing stand and he asked my father to stand right next to him. So we have a great picture of my father and Menachem Begin standing on the reviewing stand for the Israeli day parade. Um, when he died, I tried to get my father to go with me to the funeral and my father wasn't, wasn't well at the time. So we ended up not going. Um, but Menachem Begin as a leader of the Jewish people was perhaps, perhaps the greatest leader we ever had in the movie. Those of you who watched it, those of you who will see it, you'll see people from all walks of life, left wing, right wing, religious, secular. Um, we, we interviewed hundreds of people for the movie, um, bystanders, people on the, on the road, um, people in coffee shops and um, unanimity in the fact that he was a great leader. Even people who didn't agree with what his policies were, and people really thought that he changed Israel. Um, his um, his um, peace with uh, the peace that he made with Egypt was the predecessor and the prelude to the peace agreements that were signed in the last couple of years. Um, and I think momentous for Israel's, for Israel's current, present and future. Um, my view is that they will be a peace with other Arab countries, including Saudi Arabia, um, where I was there with uh, the next speaker, Abby Friedman. Um, we went uh, as some Jewish leaders to encourage the Saudis to enter the, uh, the Abraham Accords. And in my view, that's, uh, that's gonna be, excuse me, that's gonna be the future. I'm just looking if there's any questions you'd like to uh, like me to answer. Um, so great question. The, the, what was Begin's view, perspective on religion? Um, you know, sorry, one second. Menachem Begin was, um, was not a, an Orthodox uh, person, um, but he was enormously um, sympathetic and enormously uh, feeling about religion. And so what you'll see is that every time there was something momentous or something important for the government of Israel, he put a yarmulke on um, and sometimes said, the, said a blessing or a piece of, uh, piece of psalms to heal him. Um, he was very, very, sorry. He was very involved in religion. Um, and uh, he had uh, enormous respect for religious leaders. Um, you know, the... Um, the last couple of days have seen, unfortunately, the passing of uh, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, who was the greatest learned man of our time. Um, Menachem Begin went to visit um, the Lubavitcher Rebbe 
um, and several other religious leaders over his term in office to get blessings from them. So for him, religion was important, even though he wasn't an Orthodox man. Um, just like all of us, religion takes many forms, but his, his way was very special. And I'll turn to the next speaker, if that's okay. Abby Green Friedman previously practiced law at a Vegas firm and uh, specializing in corporate and gaming law. Abby became, began her career as an assistant legislative aide assigned to the Judiciary Committee for Senator Joseph Biden. Abby serves on the boards of the Jack M. Barrett Hebrew Academy, the National Museum of American Jewish History, the Nevada Women's Philanthropy, the United Way of Southern Nevada, and on the Hidden Light Institute, which brings us the uh, Begin film, and the National Board of Republican Jewish Coalition. She is also a member of International Association of Gaming Advisors. Abby is a member of the Beta Zionist Organization, the revisionist Zionist youth movement that Menachem Begin led to Poland, uh, led in Poland prior to World War II. And she spent the summers growing up in Camp Betar in upstate New York. And I understand she also knows by heart a Betar song. So uh, seven boards, very impressive. So please, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Very nice to, to meet all of you and to speak to you. Um, I, I won't be speaking as long as Phil. I don't have the, the same breadth of, of family background as he does. Um, I um, was 13 years old and by happenstance ended up in a summer camp in upstate New York that um, I had no idea what I was going to that summer. Um, when I went, I, I learned that it was a Zionist youth movement and a very, um, very strong-willed Zionist youth movement. By the end of the summer, I learned to shoot a gun, to crawl on my belly in the middle of the night and night maneuvers, and I learned all about the philosophy and teachings of Zev Jabotinsky, and I joined the Beitar movement. I would say from that time in my life to today, nothing has been more impactful than my my involvement with Betar and learning about Zionism and the love of the state of Israel through the eyes of, of the movement. Um, through that process and as I became an adult and um, I did some debating for them around the country and um, really, I, I really bought the, the, whole, the whole package. And we were in the time when I joined as we followed the tenets of, of the philosophy and of the organization, um, I wouldn't say militant, but almost militant. But we were active in the 70s for um, Soviet Jewry and um, also issues with respect to the state of Israel. And we protested and we, ran, we, we made our, our voices heard. And um, it, it, was, it was a very powerful organization. At the time um, when I joined, uh, the Khairut party was the minority party. We also got involved from the US uh, and in basically gathering uh, support from American, the American Jewish community uh, for what was in the opposition party. Um, as I went forward in my life, I never left my involvement with, with the movement. I was at the Zionist Congress. It was every four years in Jerusalem as a delegate for Beitar and then Chayrut and, and ultimately which became Likud. Um, and I really believe that it, it framed my life. The concepts of Jabotinsky, um, the, the concept of Hadar um, to, to be princely, the idea of, of Hagar, which is um, to really challenge and to be strong. And um, as I 
as I look at, I, I am so sorry, my dog is barking. Um, as I look at going forward as a Zionist, it, it runs through my veins. And um, several years ago, when the Begin Heritage Center was um, first built, a lot of us from the Beitar movement uh, got involved in supporting it and um, making sure that that fabulous museum took off. And every year I would go back uh, when I was in Israel and, and take other people to it and try to teach them about Menachem Begin. And um, a couple of years ago, I was there and the director of, of the Heritage Center said, uh, by the way, I don't know if you have any interest in this, but we're thinking there's someone who wants to put this all in film, take everything that you see that we've archived and um, try to put this in a documentary form. And I said, I'm in, whatever it is, I'm in. And um, if we could get the story of Menachem Begin out there in perpetuity in that format, that would just, that would be a, the, such an important message. So um, as Phil was stating, I got involved as a, a producer of the film and um, really just it's I think it's the beginning of getting the, the story out about a pure uh, the Zionist movement and and the the revision of Zionist movement and um, I'm so thrilled with the product and trying to get the the screenings around the world as we've been involved with now and um, that's that's basically it I will tell you that that um, I did find out that the Begin family who were not involved in making the film did finally, 30 of them came to one of the screenings that we just had in Israel. Um, Benny Begin, I think we read the, the quote to you. He said, um, the hero in the film gave you a lot of material to work with. And um, they were very pleased and um, very proud uh, of how the film came out. So um, that's basically my story. I will be a Beitari forever. Um, oh, I do have the original uniform, the Taboshet, which you wear when you're a member of Beitar, the same one that Begin wore and um, that we wore in the 70s and Beitarim still wear today. I also have a book <laughs> like Phil. So this is my book and it's The Deed. And The Deed is a fabulous book by Gerald Frank, and it's the story about the movement and some of the, the heroes um, uh, during the, the struggle for independence. And um, this was, was our Tanakh <laughs> uh, when we were in the movement. So that's, that's basically my story. I'm happy to answer any questions um, with respect to Betar. Well, I thank you very much, uh, Abby, and I'm encouraging the audience to put their questions up on chat. We'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but I would, uh, is there anything else you wanted to say, Abby? No, just enjoy the film um, and spread the word about it. And if any of you, after you see it, get the chance to go to Jerusalem, please, please by all means visit. It's a wonderful interactive um, museum that's there, um, the, the Begin Institute. Thank you. Yes, indeed, a great museum. And I was uh, very happy to hear that the Begin family went to see the movie and uh, enjoyed it. Uh, one last quote from Benny Begin, his father would have loved it. Yes. Okay, so we'll be back to all of you in a few minutes. I now would like to introduce our third speaker, uh, Alan Cahan. And in essence, we're uh, de facto in, in FJMC's domain right now. So in a way, our host. And uh, Alan is an attorney with a 34 year career with the federal government uh, as an attorney uh, in the Department of Agriculture and the rest doing analytical and database stuff, primarily for Transportation Security Administration. He retired from TSA and the federal government in June 2017, as it seems to uh, put his efforts 
into FJMC. He was the editor of Advantage, a newsletter of FJMC for club leadership when it was a paper publication. He was a secretary of FJMC, uh, Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs, then three terms as vice president with portfolios in communications, regions and club services and training and leadership development. Uh, Alan was installed as international president virtually at the 2021 International Convention held online this past June for a two year term. So thank you very much for joining in and, and participating uh, with this distinguished group. And now I call upon you to give some remarks. Uh, thank you. And I am honored to be, to be here. It's an honor to be able to, to host this. Obviously, I don't have a history as, uh, as uh, meaningful or as uh, relevant as uh, Mr. Rosen or uh, Ms. Friedman. You know, my, my experience or my contact with the Menachem Begin was watching a brilliant leader who, who was, was essential to the establishment of the state, be willing to do what needed to be done to make peace the, uh, with, uh, with its neighbors. Uh, I've always had a, a fascinating uh, 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 interest in looking at leadership and great leadership, uh, because great leadership is willing to reconsider one's beliefs, you know, firmly held beliefs, and Menachem Begin was definitely someone who was willing to do that uh, and able to do that. And to a, a large extent, the, the blossoming of uh, peace that has continued with the Abraham Accords was really started uh, by uh, Menachem Begin, being willing to sit down with one's enemies uh, to accomplish. So I'm looking forward, uh, as uh, others have, to, to watching this movie and learning more about this uh, incredible man and incredible leader. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alan. So what I'd like to do uh, next, uh, first to encourage you, to, the audience, this is your chance, go ahead and put up any questions you might have by the, from these uh, stimulating talks. The first question I have to ask actually uh, was partially answered uh, already by, by Phil, but I would welcome hearing from each of you. The left, right, and center in Israel all seem to claim Menachem Begin these days. On April 2nd, 2019, during the Israeli election cycle, the New York Times headline bled, in Israel campaign, all sides, all sides claim fabled uh, voice from the grave Menachem Begin. Why do you think uh, Begin has uh, arisen again in our thinking? Well, I think uh, at a time of uh, uh, difficulty, we look to past leaders uh, to, to hopefully give us a strength to, to face new problems. Um, I think that history meets current events. Um, I think everyone sees that, that Begin's approach of security, 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 and what it, that the Jews felt an extra central threat um, is so apparent right now that it, it's just so relevant for all for across the board, and they're they're all finding a home in that philosophy. So I, I would say I would say it a little differently. First of all, I think that. Uh, in crisis, as Abby said, everybody's looking for leadership. But I think today, I think people are looking for um, a way to live in peace with their neighbors. And I think the Abraham Accords was a wonderful step forward. Just one thing <clears throat> to mention, and I might've said it before, but Abby and I were on a trip of Jewish leaders to um, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Saudi Arabia about um, six months, eight months ago, um, and we're going again soon. But uh, what we what we saw on that trip was 
the groundwork that was set by Menachem Begin's Peace with Egypt um, translated into peace with, Abu, with United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Bahrain, and the others. <clears throat> I think there, that's a path that um, in my mind could lead to security for Israel for generations, not just you know today, not just tomorrow, but generations. And um, you know, I, I said it a few times in, in the newspapers, is that uh, I do believe that the Saudis are going to make peace with uh, with Israel, whatever the reasons they're going to do it. Most of them are extremely good ones for Israel. Um, I think that that's, that's going to change the nature of the Middle East forever. And Menachem Begin was the one who set the path. And I think people are beginning to realize that, that, uh, that Menachem Begin gets credit for that. Even people, I mean, if you watch the movie, you'll see people who say, um, I disagree with Menachem Begin politically, philosophically, but he was the greatest leader we ever had. And that's the quote that I think should stand out in all of our minds. The fact that leadership doesn't necessarily mean that you agree 100%. Um, what leadership means is that you take the country forward in a path that makes sense. So. Thank you. If I may uh, slightly switch, we've heard all these wonderful things about Menachem Begin Let's talk for a minute uh, about the film. What did you like in the film and what disappointed you? Yeah, so. <laughs> I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna take that. So, so I'll start with what disappointed me because I, I was pretty vocal about it. Um, and this also uh, harkens back to what you see when you go to that interactive um, the museum on, on Begin. I took someone through it who was not Jewish and who didn't really know a lot about Begin. And as we went through, he remarked about the project renewal and all the social policies that were so clearly um, what would be in the US to almost to the left on how um, Begin was um, socially, uh, his, his um, domestic policies. And the comment was, I, I can't believe this about him. I, I really didn't know this. You know, we only knew of him as a hawk. So my, my disappointment was that that aspect of Begin, which to me um, really shows the, the roundedness of, of what kind of leader he was, um, I wish that there was more of that so that people saw that he was really project renewal and redoing and, and, and revitalizing neighborhoods and, and what he did for domestic social issues in Israel. I wish there was more of that. Um, on the positive side, it, it really showed, as Phil was saying, that he was uh, such a man of the people. And I was so proud of, of how it it showed this great leadership um, and the, the, the humbleness also of Begin that there was so many accolades for him and he was just this humble, simple man. And I think that message came, came clear with, with how the film put it together. Um, you saw a man that just was so driven, but it wasn't ego driven. It was, it was just a humble, um, humble man. And so that's, those are my, my two takeaways. If I may, I would just like Please. to echo what you said. I was living in Israel during the term of Begin's office. And a big issue at that time was uh, bringing the North African and the other Jews more into society. And if I understand correctly, uh, the, uh, that group still votes primarily for Likud, in part because of that. No, so, so you're 100% right. I think that uh, um, 
Menachem Begin appealed to everybody in the country, um, right, left, center, religious, secular, boom, 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 everybody. In fact, um, in the museum, um, Abby, the, that Abby referred to, the Begin Museum, um, I've, I've also taken a lot of people to, uh, to the museum. Um, and the amazing thing uh, is th there's a lot of exhibits that are great, but my favorite is this, the playback of the speech that he gave in running for the second term. It's called the Chach Chachim speech. And um, I, took, uh, I took Mitt Romney when he was running for election, running for the presidency. I took him to the Begin Museum and we watched that speech five times. He just kept telling me, give it, give it to me again. It's a speech that basically um, he, he took, took a line that was said by the opposition um, the night before a campaign event. And it was a line that uh, called the people who support Menachem Begin, Chach Chachim, which really means I, I'm going to use the word low life. Um, but what uh, Menachem Begin w did was he took that speech and generalized it. He said, they call all of us, they're calling all of us Chach Chachim. Every one of us from Morocco, from Algeria, but also from Russia, from Ukraine, from, from uh, you know, Poland, from Germany, everybody. Kulanu Chach Chachim is the famous line. And the reason Romney loved it was he saw it as a unification speech. And he said to me that if he could, if he could figure out how to get that speech to translate that to his campaign, he could be the president of the United States. And, as it turned out, he didn't. But uh, um, but it was a fascinating, fascinating event. I think what disappointed me about the movie was um, I think there were a couple of um, places in the movie where they focused on um, some difficult parts of Began's life. Um, which I 100% agreed should be in there, but I think they focused it a bit, excuse me, a bit too much and not enough focus on, as Abby said, the so social changes that he made in the country to try to unify the country, didn't focus on the economic changes that he made to take the country away from being a... Uh, you know, socialist um, kibbutz uh, type country and to turn it instead into a capitalist, you know, right now, one of the premier um, capitalist societies in the world, where the only place in the world during the last year of COVID, the GDP was up to eight point up by 8.3%, um, while everybody else in the world was down. It's, he made some amazing changes. <laughs> so I wish they would have focused a little more on that. Let me, let me add uh, one other thing that, um, you know, just something that Phil said that made me think of this. I mean, just from what we're saying that we wish there was more of, um, this, this could have been a mini series, uh, you know, like a three part mini series. There's so, uh, maybe five part, there's so much information on him. And if you, you just look at the, the life and, and when you see the film, you'll see um, so many components from doing, you know, being in a jail in Russia to, um, you know, first be, coming into the country, then the Uruguayan, and then just, just through his political career, there's so many components. You could do an hour, you know, on each at least, maybe longer. So this had to be cut down, the film had to be trimmed. Um, and even now, as the film exists, it will be um, put in different formats for a teaching tool, um, you know, shorter formats um, to be used uh, for education purposes. So it's very difficult when you, you do uh, a, 
a film on someone that had so much um, information and so many components of their life. So um, we, you know, as, as we complain what's not in it, um, I really complain that this is not five parts, you know, uh, but as it goes, it was done as a documentary um, in, in the original format um, that you'll see today. Abby, if no, I no. may submit, uh, there have been, that I know of, 50 presentations of the movie, most followed by a discussion. So I would submit that we're part of the mini series exploring <laughs> the great. life of Bay. Victor, that's great. Victor, you know, you said before, we have to thank Rachel Greenberg for it. And I see as I scroll through that Rachel, Rachel joined us um, as we were talking. So I, I want to I hope say, you will tell her all the nice things I said about her. You did, you did, and that's why I'm making bringing it to our attention, to her attention. Thank you, thank you, okay. Alan. Do you want to weigh in with any comments? There's nothing that I can add that hasn't been said. You know, I, since I haven't seen the film, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to seeing the perspective. You know, I'm always reminded, uh, having read the, the Hamilton biography before the musical came out. And as I said, I was as, as excited as Lim Emanuel Miranda was when reading it. The difference was he's got an enormous amount of talent and I do not. The, uh, <laughs> and so I, I would say, listen, you know, read the book, you know, uh, read the biography, read his autobiography, uh, study more. You know, hopefully, hopefully the, the film will give one a taste. Since my wife and I will be going to Israel this coming October, uh, that will be one of the, the sites that I visit while we're there. Anti-Semitism. Uh, this is risen now. And when I saw the first uh, snippets of the movie, it did not include the introduction about anti-Semitism that had, leads off the movie. Uh, any comments about that? And uh, in what way has Begin uh, maybe led the way about this issue or not? Well, I, I'll just make one comment and then I'll turn it over to the others. Um, I think that Begin was probably more than any prime minister in Israel's history, um, very focused on what was happening to Jews around the world. Um, he helped save the Jews um, the Russians, the Syrians, um, the, um, the Ethiopians, nonstop, his focus was on Jews. I promise you that if it was an anti-Semitism problem um, in the United States when he was in power, he would make sure to come right over and make an appearance um, and try to figure out how to fight it because that was as I said before, he considers himself, considered himself to be the prime minister of the Jewish people, which I think, you know, as we say in my language, kolakavod, kolakavod to somebody who wants to take that responsibility. And it's, to me, it's something that uh, is great and something that makes me proud that I'm part of a movie about somebody like that. Thank you. I want to call on Les here uh, to weigh in. Uh, any comments or discussion? I'd like to call on one or two of them that uh, chatted some questions to us. So why don't we do this? Let's give it a try. So the first question came from Jonathan Brody. Jonathan, if you can somehow mute yourself and talk, please ask the question yourself. If not, I'll ask it for you. Well, I love the movie. I thought it was fantastic. I watched it yesterday. I wanted to know how the footage was. Um, how did you obtain all that great footage of Menachem Begin and, and historical uh, perspective from Israel? Um, and I, he just did so much for the growth of the state of Israel. I was, I, I didn't know a lot. So uh, thank you for creating the film. Jonathan, that was um, a good portion of the work that went into the film was finding footage um, and some of the footage hasn't been seen in 40 years so I think uh, I think when you watch the movie um, you you say to yourself how did they get that stuff um, and 
I think that's a credit to the producer and credit to the team. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, Jonathan. If, if Rachel, I don't know if she can unmute, she can talk to you a little bit about some, I mean, also getting the rights to some of the footage. And there were some challenges um, that we faced on getting releases and getting some of the rights and who, who owned it. Um, and I don't know if, if Rachel can chime in. Rachel, can you? <laughs> Hi there, sorry about that. I'm, um, I'm happy to jump in, I'm actually, almost headed to the airport to go to Australia. So that's why I was on mute. Um, but I also did all of the English research for the film. So we had Israeli researchers and we had um, myself who did research at the Carter Foundation, the Reagan Foundation, um, Library of Congress, the Vanderbilt Media Archives, um, National Archives. And basically what, you're, what you were seeing, if you saw any news clips, any of the documents in English, um, those all were those are all things that I found during the research period. A lot of documents become unclassified, declassified about 20 to 30 years after the fact. So people haven't seen them. Um, one of the interesting things with the news clips is that back in the 70s or the 60s, there was an insurance executive in Vanderbilt in Nashville who came to New York and visited one of the network rates television shows and asked to see a news report from the week before. And they said, oh, we don't save those. We film right over them. And he went back to Vanderbilt and he gave $200,000 and endowed Vanderbilt to tape every single nightly news after that. So there's about a 15 year period where if you're looking for clips from any of the networks, you have to get them from Vanderbilt. The networks don't have them. And the only way you could order them based on an abstract but the only way to actually watch them and figure out what I went down to Nashville. Um, the other thing we had great, great researchers in Israel. So any of the footage you found in Israel, about four or five years ago, there was a three-part um, Israeli documentary, and we were fortunate enough that they had dug up some of that footage and made their way around all the archives. Rachel, yeah, what is, are we able to comment on also some of the, the releases that we got and getting the rights to some of this as well? In, in terms of the images and the, and the footage? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's a long process to get the rights. We're very fortunate. There's something called the government press office. So a lot of the photos come from them and they give them to you freely and you just have to credit them. Um, but other things we worked for months with the lawyers during COVID to find the rights, to find the owners. Like there's one piece of footage that we had to track down a French television network and the man who owned the rights died and we tracked down the son and we're communicating with him in half French, half English. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a scavenger hunt. Even there's a photo at the end of, um, at the cemetery of Bagan's, of the tombs of Bagan and Eliza. So you find a name, you Google it, you figure out that it's a Czech name. You Google the guy again, you see that he takes photos of different Jewish sites. Then I happened to call my brother-in-law who I know knows the people in the Jewish community in the Czech Republic. You get to them and then they connect you. So a lot of it, you have to track down very specific photos or, um, or images there. Um, the documents are absolutely the most fascinating to me and the declassified, like you could be in the Carter Foundation or the Carter Library and you put in a request and they come out with a trolley and there are all these folders and you start to open the folders and at the bottom, I remember I found it just looked like a white piece of paper and you start to unfold it and it's unfolded in fours and it's actually the map that they used at Camp David that they decided on which land they're going to give back. They had it just marked it in colored magic marker. So there'd be like a, a purple triangle, which would represent the settlements and a green square would represent something else. So you start to see, like you start to feel history. And to me, that was really exciting is that when you start to open up the folders or you request something that you know no one's seen or it just became declassified you know, a few months before that you are sharing something with the world that's different. And you really got insight into Menachem Begin and how he related to people. So when he communicated with Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher, he spoke from his heart. He spoke very humbly. 
Um, he had a very strong control of the English language. And I'm happy after this call for Les or Victor and a follow-up email, I'm happy to send some of the documents, which I think people will find pretty fascinating to read through. Beautiful. Um, by the way, if anyone uh, on the Zoom uh, audience or speakers alike thinking of making a movie, uh, I highly recommend Rachel to do the uh, uh, distribution and production and uh, whatever else uh, you, you need because she is a one-man wrecking crew. Uh, you know, she mentioned she's on her way to Australia uh, and uh, just you know one event after another, but uh, really promoting a great movie and making it, uh, uh, let's just say, uh, available to a lot more people than might otherwise watch it. Oh, thank uh, you. No, that's true. Uh, um, one point I wanted to make um, before I go is that the Begin movie, despite what people may think before they see the movie, the Begin movie is a love story. And in fact, the story of Menachem Begin's life is a true love story, probably one of the greatest love stories of all time. He dedicated his life to his wife and his wife dedicated hers to him. And I think that comes out so clearly in the movie that I think uh, everybody, you'll, you'll all get emotional when you see some of the scenes of Menachem Begin talking to his wife, particularly after Camp David and after the Peace Accords. So my, my view is that part of the love story. And, and by the way, um, I'm sure many of you have seen the beautiful picture um, taken on the plane on the way to Camp David, where Menachem Begin is putting the shoe on his wife um, as the plane is landing. He, he's doing it himself. That, that picture was taken by David Rubinger, a very famous Israeli photographer. Um, I have the original signed picture of that, uh, that um, photograph. Um, and it, it hangs in my, uh, in my apartment, in my house in Israel. So um, maybe someday when you're all there and we're there together, we can, uh, we can come over and have a drink to Menachem Begin at, uh, at my place in Jerusalem, which is literally a block away from the Begin Museum. So I'm gonna say goodbye and thank you, Victor. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, my dear friend, Abby. And uh, thank you, Rachel and everybody who put this together and everybody who was on. I, I thank you for, for joining us and hope we, uh, hope we made it interesting and I hope you love, love, love the movie. You can always write to me if you have any questions. Um, and uh, my, my email address is jprosen at aol.com. So take care, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you very much for your presence and also for your uh, insightful comments. And I certainly agree with you about the love story. They met uh, when uh, they both were 17. And after his wife passed away, we saw in the movie that Began started to decay without her. So no doubt about it, a great love story. Okay, Les? Steve Mandel still there if you could maybe ask your questions uh, i thought they were uh, excellent questions i wanted you to share with the group thank you for the excellent movie i have a, a two-part question what was ben gurion's relationship with menachem begin and did begin ever forgive ben gurion for sinking of the altanana the ship with jews I think, Rachel, you can probably answer what we archived for the film um, about that relationship. But uh, and with respect to the Altalena, um, I think that, that there, there was a forgiveness. Um, you know, ultimately, he, he was the opposition party, but there, you know, there were things fundamentally that, that kept them bound as Zionists. And I don't think he ever lost sight of that. I think um, the answer is that Begin ultimately became from opposition leader, uh, the absolute quintessential statesman and a statesman that accepted um, all, all facets of, of the political spectrum. And Rachel, you can get more specific on it. 
Yeah. So thank you, Abby, for that. And and so as you you've seen in the film as well, they had a very contentious relationship. Um, it, there are a lot of stories in the Knesset that Ben Gurion would never actually re refer to um, refer to Begin as his name. He'd say the man sitting next to Mr. Bader, who was another member of Knesset. But there was a softening. So after, during 1967, when there was a change of government, Fagan actually went and approached Ben-Gurion because he recognized he always put the interests of his people first. And he and others realized that Ben-Gurion would be the best person to come back into the ruling power. You know, toward the end of his life, um, Fagan would go to Ben-Gurion's house um, and Paula Ben-Gurion's wife would, would bring him in. They were never best of friends at all, but they definitely had an understanding and a respect for each other at the end, but all through the opposition um, and all through a huge portion of um, both their lives and fighting. So what you have to understand is from what their means were, they wanted a state. They wanted a safe place for Jewish people to be. So they had the same objective in mind. They just took very different approaches to it. Um, but in the end, it, you know, there was a, a softening of that relationship that was recognized. My uh, question is related to the, um, the unfortunate massacre that occurred um, from in Lebanon. Um, did Begin himself uh, feel that he was responsible uh, and not really put blame on Sharon, who may have been responsible? And uh, what and how did he come to grips with that? Mm -hmm. well, well, I think, I mean, you saw how he came to grips with it. He resigned. So he took responsibility. I think Michael Oren says in the movie that, you know, the buck stops with Menachem Begin. And he, and, and also the other person who said something that was interesting in the film was Yona Klimovitsky, who was his secretary. He said sometimes he knew before, sometimes he knew after, but he was a leader who always took responsibility. Um, do I think he knew what was going on? I don't personally, based on what we talked to everyone, but it destroyed him. And it was a combination, as Phil mentioned, his love for Eliza and Eliza who helped prop him up as well. There, there are stories when we talk to people that you know, he I wouldn't I wouldn't say he had depression because I'm that's a clinical diagnosis, but she was a, a huge support from him, both for in their personal life and in, in the political life. So the combination of her death, and he was absolutely distraught. One single life meant the world to him, and he saw those numbers turn every day. You saw in the shot in the film, I think it was five hundred and one, but it killed him that he was losing the men who were fighting for the country. And he was looking out for the best interest in the country. And I think he realized that that's not how things were playing out. And he, he took a really responsible position in actually resigning because he, he didn't think he could actually carry out the role. I, I think the film really portrays that. And you're gonna feel as you watch this film, you know, you're going up and up and up in his career and, and his strength and his power. And then all of a sudden you're gonna feel a sadness. And, and I think that the director really showed that and gave, you're gonna feel those emotions that he felt and the brokenness of the man uh, towards the end. Aaron Altman had a very interesting question I thought about Sobri Jury. Considering how Begin supported Sobri Jury, what would be his position regarding Ukraine and the Jewish community? I think, I mean, Ray, I think Rachel can can go at that. Do you wanna, we could talk about it from a Zelensky point of view um, to, about leadership and being an unapologetic leader. Um, and uh, I will, I'll start with one thing and then let Rachel pretty much take this. Um, Odessa connects to Begin. Um, Jezeb Jabotinsky was born in Odessa and Odessa, um, has had a very strong Jewish community and a strong um, Beitar movement there. And there, there is a absolute connection between Begin um, with his time um, when he was in prison as well, Russian, and Rachel can explain a lot more and you'll see that in the film, but the, the, 
the history goes back um, in his life and also in his mentor, which was Jabotinsky. Uh, go ahead, Bridge. Yeah, no, thank you, Abby. Um, so I think if you think about Begin, anytime there was a Jew in peril, he took every measure to save their life. And quite frankly, it wasn't just Jews, it was, it was people in peril, as you saw with the Vietnamese refugees. Now for Begin, if you think about it, this first week of office, he brought over the Vietnamese refugees. One of his next steps was bringing the Ethiopians. He fought to bring over the Soviet Jews. I have letters that he wrote to Reagan pleading for them. Um, and right now with the Ukrainian Jews in peril, he would be the first to be doing what Israel's doing. I mean, Israel, Israel is exemplifying everything that Begin did. They're finding ways JDC and the Jewish agency are on the borders, taking them out. They're sending in hospitals to, you know, take care of the people that are suffering. Um, so I think, I, I think you're seeing a lot of Begin's values and a lot of things that are happening from history play out in the present. So Abby mentioned, you were dealing with leadership. Look at Zelensky, look how he's acting. She's, he is unapologetic. He's fighting for his people. Um, he believes in standing up and being proud and unapologetic. The country's facing an existential threat. That's what Israel is doing. You think about the Begin Doctrine and, and they, don't ha they don't have the same kind of tools to be preemptive and they're begging for them. So I think it's actually interesting in the last few weeks when we've been showing the film, to really sit back and think about, you know, what would you do? These people are really strong leaders who had to make tough decisions and they both acted on behalf of their people with humility. Um, and so I think, I, I think it would be really interesting, I have to say, to have Zelensky and Begin at a dinner party. Um, and that, that would be an interesting evening. But I do think that Begin would never have given up with bringing Jews over. And I think you guys have probably heard about the Falash Mura who are in Gondar, Ethiopia. Um, they were converted to Christianity at the turn of the century, but they're very much practicing devout in Jewish tradition. Um, and they've been stuck in limbo in Ethiopia for about 20 years. Um, there's been a lot of push and pull with them. And you're gonna see actually the, the Penino Tamano Shada who is in the film and is the Alian absorption minister, they're bringing them over now um, because they're bringing all the Ukrainians and, and she's pleading that, you know, now's the time also to bring them. So very much in line with Begin's philosophy. So um, I, um, we just have a couple more questions and we'll maybe we'll wrap it up, but I think Phil Margolis had a question. Uh, Phil, do you want to maybe ask it yourself? Sure. And uh, first I'll ask my wife so she can get in there too. But uh, her question was, we, and by the way, the film was excellent. We really, really enjoyed it. So thank you. Um, my, um, my wife's qu a question, which was a good one, is there, there, the, there were students at the end or, or young people, they were probably Americans. And so I, didn't, I don't know if there was an explanation to that. Mm -hmm. And my, I'll just jump into my question. So, and, um, it was interesting, you know, um, I, I did read the prime ministers and um, but it was great to learn so many different aspects about Begin. And one interesting thing was his, uh, the film made a point that he treated uh, the Arabs, he wanted Arabs to be equal, uh, treated fairly in the, and, and so when you see uh, today, there, there's a big controversy over the security in Arab villages uh, and education inequality. And, and so I, I don't know if it's probably too big of a question to say, how did we get here from the same party in power? But, you know, how do you think he would be dealing with that today? Hmm. Two good questions. So Abby, I'll start and then I'll let you jump in. So to answer your first question about the people in the cemetery, they were not American, they were Israelis. Um, one of them was a, a son of two Americans, but he lives there. The reason that was put in, that was actually the executive producer um, had thought up the idea and wanted to put them in. And just so everyone knows, when Benny Begin saw the film, and I have a recording of it, he actually said he loved the film, by the way. I don't know if, if Abby spoke about it, but you know, he said the movie does what a movie should do. It's moving and 
the hero gave you a lot of material, but he said, my father would have loved the last scene. He said he would have loved the children reading his will. And the song that was playing in the background was a song called Sion Tamati, which is all about dying. Um, the idea behind that scene was just that. It was young people, you know, reading his will, understanding and passing on his legacy. And it was also, you know, the multicolored uh, uh, cultural pot of Israel. There was an Ethiopian, there was a Sephardic, there was a girl, there was a boy. So it was kind of a combination of this is the next generation and we're passing the legacy on. Um, so that was the, the story behind that scene. Um, in terms of the, the Arab, I mean, that's, that's a tougher question. I think, you know, Israel struggles with that now. There's a lot of talk about that. There's a lot of talk in the elections. It's like, how do we, how do we improve the schools? How do we improve the infrastructure, the roads? That doesn't have to do necessarily with like aut autonomy and military control. And one thing you have to understand is like so much that you read in the paper about the history and everything, there's three types of Arabs, right? In Israel, there's the 48, there's the 67, and then you have the Judea Samaria slash occupied territories, whatever anyone wants to call it. So if you're talking about the ones that were, let's say 48 and already in Israel, those were the ones that you saw in the film. Um, and you're right, there are issues there. The villages, they don't have as, as the infrastructure and as good because the schools are, are separated you're finding that there aren't as many um, opportunities. But I do think that's first and foremost on a lot of platforms now. Um, and I, I would like to think that the same way, you know, Abby talked about that, that uh, project renewal and he was working to break down socioeconomic barriers in society between the Mizrahi and Spartak Jews and the Ashkenazi Jews. I would hope that we would have reached a point where he was also working toward that with the Arab population. Thank you. Uh, Abby, did you want to add anything? Um, not much more to it other than I think that he would also look at a lot of the internal problems um, within the, the, the borders, the, the issues in the Negev with the Bedouins. I, I think he, he would be addressing those issues. Um, again, he, he approached social issues very strongly. And um, I think that he would have probably been a lot firmer about those things. Um, but again, I'll default back to that he, he believed in a Jewish majority and I don't think he would have wavered on, on that. Uh, I thought Joel Baker had a very interesting question. Uh, Joel, are you still here? Uh, yes, I am. Let me tell you what, uh, what prompted the question. Actually, I really, really did enjoy the movie. It was great. And thank you very much for bringing it to us. Um, and when they were, uh, during the movie, they talked, um, they showed some documents where, you know, Begin was making his corrections during the Camp David Accord. And, and, and at that time, when I was watching it, I thought, gee, I wonder what they actually uncovered and what they could say and what they couldn't say. And so when you brought it up uh, a few moments ago, I, I, the question that I had was, what didn't you find that you wish you could have found and or what couldn't you say because of either legal or security issues? Um, there wasn't anything that there wasn't anything that we found that we weren't allowed to show. So when we say there were legal and security, there were, there's nothing, there were no legal and security issues. Otherwise it would be classified still. So I wouldn't have had access to anything that I wasn't supposed to. The legal issues, when I said we worked with the lawyers, that's more about fair use and about the costs of archival and images. So just to explain a little bit about um, cost to licensing. So if you actually had a news clip from NBC or ABC, you may be paying like several hundred dollars a second for that. So one little clip could be multiple thousands of dollars. But what fair use allows, and especially in a documentary, is if you have someone like Michael Oren making a comment about something that then appears in the news clip that Tom Brokler is talking about, you're able to use it without paying the licensing rights because you don't necessarily need it to make your film. So you already have the information coming from the ambassador. 
So there are, there are, especially in the documentary world, there are ways to kind of work around it. Um, so that's, that's kind of when I talked about all the legal stuff, it was more around the licensing versus what we're allowed and not allowed to put in from a security standpoint. Uh, Abby, do you want to add anything? No, that part was all Rachel. Okay. <laughs> Um, but, I, but I do have the document. I mean, the document where he crossed things out. I have. I could send that to you guys because it is absolutely fascinating. Like he would cross out one word and say like a reason why that one word shouldn't belong in a document. Les, if I may um, say a final thought about all of this, and uh, I have a longer term perspective. In my lifetime, Israel was reborn. I was eight years old. Begin was instrumental in the great success Israel has become. 80 years ago, before, this, uh, before Israel, Jews were on the wrong side of the walls. And now, exemplified by Ukraine, the Jews are there helping the people that are refugees, just as we needed the help before. So for me, I think that uh, Israel has been a great success, and there's no question from hearing everybody that Begin was a critical part of this. Victor, wonderfully said, and we thank everyone for being a part of this. Uh, Abby, Phil, uh, everyone that's part of it. You were all excellent, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Rachel, uh, you are the best. So thank you all very, very much. We thank you all for coming. Thank you.